You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. Whether it's for food, fuel, drinks, or snacks, about half of the U.S. population shops at a convenience store every day. We'll talk about what we see at stores and what the future may hold for our industry. These days, everything requires extra planning. Going to work, going to stores, going, well, anywhere. Employees and retailers have thought carefully through many processes and nuances in order to make work days and shopping trips easy and safe. With regulations changing frequently, it's imperative to keep up with what we're going to talk about with today's guests. Welcome to Convenience Matters. I'm Carolyn Schneer with Nax. And I'm Jeff Leonard, also with Nax. It's fall here and the news is beginning to fill again with rising coronavirus cases around the globe. And hopefully we're collectively able to keep that curve flat to bring back that old saying from six months ago. Well, with that, we want to talk a bit about safety and why it matters. Our guest today is Christina Lewis, who is a partner with Goodwin Law Firm. Welcome, Christina. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thanks, Christina. I'd really like to start today with having you tell us a bit about yourself and your expertise on this topic, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Well, as you said, Carolyn, I'm a partner in Goodwin's Employment Practice Group. I represent employers in all facets of their relationships with employees from A to Z. So everything from hiring to onboarding to documentation to the termination process when that becomes necessary. I also do quite a bit of reviewing, you know, contracts, handbooks, personnel policies, handling, you know, sticky issues with leaves of absences and those kinds of things. And then I also do quite a bit of litigation and training. Um, the litigation is when you can't prevent litigation, uh, you know, discrimination cases, harassment cases and, and the like, uh, sometimes wage and hour cases. And then the training is usually of the anti-harassment, anti-discrimination variety. And I'll, I'll go into companies and train both management and uh, subordinates on how to comply uh, with their anti-harassment and anti-discrimination policies. So I guess the first question in talking about COVID is not necessarily related to, directly related to uh, liability or things like that, but how has COVID affected this landscape with employees and and how um, they are... um, perceived in the work environment and some of the issues that you need to deal with um, thinking about HR practices? Well, Jeff, that's a really good question. I would say since March, COVID has really taken over the employment law world (laughs) Um, because it really affects every facet of an employee's, you know, day. So, What we're seeing quite a bit of um, when COVID first hit were concerns that employers had about furloughs and reductions in force. Um, And then there were leaves of absences that were related to COVID and what protections might apply there. And then there was a big push towards reopening. Um, And so there was the development of reentry plans, you know, how to train employees on safety issues, what protocols should be put in place, um, and then how to deal with the inevitable, um, you know, employee concerns that arise in such a, um, a, a new and scary environment, right? It's, you know, what to do with nervous employees, what to do if employees become symptomatic, um, you know, what if we have employees who are in high risk or vulnerable categories? All of those are kinds of questions that I, I answer daily right now. And I would imagine that it's also um, with this environment where where people may be a little less hesitant to have face to face interactions. That's all probably also changed the nature of HR and some of the things that HR professionals need to look at in terms of uh, the traditional way of documenting things or or interacting with people has also changed. Uh, are there things that you've noticed or or recommend related to that? Sure. Um, with a lot of employers who have the ability to, ha- you know, have employees working remotely, there are questions like how do we track the time that's being spent while they're working? You know, some employees are paid on an hourly basis, um, but if they're not actually in the brick and mortar of the building, you know, how do we know when they're working and when they're not? How do we accurately track those hours? There are concerns about proprietary information and employees, you know, kind of printing things at home and leaving it out or not having a shredder that's convenient to them and you know how do you protect your trade secrets and confidential information in that type of environment 
And then we've also had a lot of employers who are just realizing that they need to go back and look at their personnel policies and sort of modify them to fit the times. Um, you know, in the past, for example, we had a lot of clients who would have unlimited vacation policies or unlimited paid time off policies. And in this environment, that's not something that works very well um, because you might have employees who need a really long leave of absence. Um, and so we have a lot of employers who are now actually adopting personnel personnel policies that are COVID specific and they're, you know, kind of supersede the old policies, but only while we're in this pandemic with the hope that once this ends, they'll go back to the old way. So Christina, let me pivot a little bit towards, I'll pivot. There's that word. Sorry. (laughs) Back um, towards the retailer a little bit too. So um, I want to follow up on what you just said about um, leave policies, things like that. Is there anything that you've noticed with um, retailers in, especially in the convenience space um, that they're doing in terms of some of those policies? Yeah, I mean, one of the first things that I've seen among retailers is that, you, you know, they're, most of them have set up kind of a task force or a committee. Um, and the purpose of that task force and committee is to understand the different guidelines um, that are in place related to COVID. So there are, you know, uh, part, as, as many know, the CDC has guidelines, OSHA has guidelines, and most states have issued their own set of guidelines on safety and reopening and, you know, how you can safely operate. And so the task force has to be on top of each and every one of those guidelines and where they intersect. And even more importantly, those guidelines seem to change on almost a daily basis, right? So uh, it isn't like you can just sort of print out the guidelines and then put them on your shelf and reference them from time to time. You actually have to kind of have it on a web browser and refresh them because what might be true yesterday won't be true tomorrow. And so a lot of employers have these task force whose sole job it is to just stay on top of those things and then modify their policies to make sure that their policies comply with what those safety guidelines state. Um, And I would say that retailers have done, for the most part, a a very good job of that because there a lot of states have very sector-specific guidelines targeted toward the retail industry. Well, and I imagine with um, with the convenience industry, it's it's uh, almost a little harder when you're working with like an office space. I know, um, you know, where we work at Nax, we were were primarily in the office, um, and you know that's who we dealt with. We didn't have a lot of customer facing um, mm-hmm. activity, but now in a convenience retailer, they do. So um, not only do the HR and the store managers and the store leaders have to communicate to their employees on here's what you need to do to keep yourself safe, but also here's what you need to do to keep your customers safe. And they do intersect sometimes because a lot of it's like PPE and things like that, but I don't want to steal your thunder. Is there anything that's, um, that retailers are getting most tripped up with in this space? Yeah, I mean, so since the onset of COVID, this has been a pretty litigation heavy area. I mean, I think there have been 4,500 different lawsuits filed that are COVID related since COVID first began. And, you know, those lawsuits really run the gamut. They're everything from negligence related, like the the store or the employer is not um, adhering to safety protocols. And so someone gets sick or worse, they they die as a result of that or, or they claim that it's a result of that, which can lead to litigation. Um, But there are also, you know, OSHA inspections and citations where OSHA is going into different businesses and looking at whether or not that business is complying with the OSHA standards. Um, And what I find is what people are getting tripped up is that, you know, when you first reopen, there's this big push towards revamping everything as you once knew it, right? You've got a task force, you've changed your policies, everybody understands the importance of it. But when time marches on, there can be this complacency where you start to lose some of that discipline. And and it's a natural process, it happens to everyone. But I think the key is, is to train and retrain employees and you know, make them understand again that, you know, yes, there's litigation risk and liability risk, but the importance of doing this and doing it right, um, you know, has, there are human lives at stake and they play a part in both the, the, you know, their stakeholders and their own safety, but in the safety of the public. And I think when you remind them of those things and you train and retrain and keep it on the forefront, it keeps people from getting complacent. um, And that lack of discipline kind of is less of a concern. Um, So that is my number one recommendation is stay on top of the guidelines, adapt quickly as they change, and then train and retrain your employees so that they know uh, what's expected of them and how they can stay safe. 
And I, I love that you mentioned the human element in, 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 in thinking about how um, to protect the business, you, you just look at what are the things that you need to do because you want to do them anyway. Um, now, the kids have asked me, it's like, can you sue somebody for that? And, and it, my answer is always, you can sue someone for anything. Um, we, we can all sue each other after this for some reason uh, about the podcast. The, the big differential is we're not going to win. I mean, you need a case. So in, in taking apart those two elements of um, the idea of being open to a lawsuit, and you mentioned what I think was 4,500 lawsuits so far, mm -hmm. are, are there, how do you look differently at minimizing the like, likelihood you'll be sued and is that different than minimizing the likelihood you will lose a suit or are the things that you do largely the same? Yeah, it's also a very good question. Um, I, you know, there are different types of lawsuits that have emerged because of COVID, um, but I think they can kind of be broken down into two buckets. One is a, a negligence case. Um, and I think a lot of people have heard of this, but Walmart was actually the first defendant in one of these cases. Um, and in that case, there was uh, an employee who worked in the, you know, overnight stocking shelves and doing maintenance work at Walmart. It was in the Chicago area. And he contracted the virus and unfortunately succumbed to it. So his estate sued. And the allegations are that Walmart wasn't adhering to safety standards. Um, they weren't cleaning and sterilizing. They um, weren't promoting social distancing. And they weren't providing PPE to their employees. And they weren't taking it seriously when employees would complain of symptoms. Those are the allegations. I mean, to be fair, Walmart denies all of them. And we don't know yet you know, who's going to prevail in that lawsuit. But the best way to defend that first bucket, that negligence claim, is to show that you're not negligent. Um, and the best way to do that is to show that you are in compliance with what OSHA says you're supposed to do, what the CDC says you're supposed to do, and with what your state and local guidelines say you're supposed to do. And if you can show that you are taking steps to make, meet all those guidelines, it would be awfully hard um, to prove negligence, um, especially in the context of a pandemic like this. I mean, people may still get sick despite best efforts, but if you've taken all the steps to comply with those guidelines, a negligence case is not going to go very far. Um, the other bucket that I just want to quickly mention is really relates to leaves of absences. And for this one, I feel um, very um, I feel sorry for employers who have to try to navigate this because there are so many different types of leaves. Some are protected and some are not. There was a new federal statute um, that back in March um, that talked about, you know, giving paid leave when people have symptoms of the virus or they need to stay home for childcare reasons that are related to the virus. And a lot of employers just got caught off guard about, you know, what they needed to do to comply. And those are probably easier lawsuits for plaintiff's attorneys because, um, you know, if you didn't comply with the law and you denied somebody their statutory protections, it's easy to sue over that. So that's, again, why staying on top of these guidelines and what the different regulations say and the different laws that are passed are so critical um, is just to make sure you've got somebody on the administrative side who knows what they're supposed to do and how to handle those requests. Now, we joke about, um, and, and it's not, this is not, there's a lot of serious things going on now, but we, we joke that when we're planning something, we say, you know, we don't have that much experience in planning during the middle of a global pan, plan, pandemic. But in, in taking that through how retailers operate, we have about two thirds of the industry is our small operators, one store or so. So when they are doing everything in the store, they're buying, they're maybe running a, a shift, they're, they're acting as HR, they're, they're doing everything they can to keep afloat. Um, then you add all these complications that come along with the pandemic. It, it, I assume that their ignorance is not an excuse in terms of these things, but what are the very, very basics that a small operator should do or should look at to do? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. It is really burdensome for a small operator, and you don't have the luxury of a task force when, or, a ta or a committee um, looking at these things. What I would recommend for a very small employer is to look at those CDC guidelines, look at the OSHA guidelines, um, and look at the state and local guidelines. If you 
if you're really time crunched and can only look at one, if you're in a state that's highly regulated, I would look at those state and local guidelines because chances are if you're in compliance with those, you're going to be in compliance with the others. But those are the three big things that I would stay on top of. But at the end of the day, the rules really come down to, you know, ensuring social distancing, hand washing, you know, face masks, um, and doing your best to keep the store as clean as possible and sanitizing. There are some elements around contact tracing when somebody becomes ill. Um, but, you know, if you, if you adhere to those, you know, basic sort of uh, guidelines, you know, cleaning, social distancing, face masks, then, you know, you're going to be doing pretty good um, with respect to what the latest guidelines say out there. So I would do those things. In terms of knowing what statutes have passed and what apply to you, you know, to the extent that you are you can get industry letters um, or uh, something that might alert you to those things, that might be the easiest way to do that. Um, you know, so far there's been only one federal statute that's really impacted employers, um, and that's that Family First Coronavirus response act um, and that one is going to be with us until the end of um, the year of 2020 so December of 2020 so that's something that you know employers should know is out there um, and if that's these are new words to you I would suggest just you, know, you can even just google that and it'll give you a good summary of what's required so uh, that one's through 2020 obviously and then you know who knows what will happen after that but um in terms of where we are right now as i mentioned in the beginning we're recording in um in the fall and this has been going on for six months six plus months at this point so there's a bit of burnout out there if you will i think and mm -hmm. i'm not getting into a mask debate believe me but you know it's it's things that were commonplace, you know, wash your hands really hard and sanitize everything in your place, whether you, as soon as you get home from the store or you know, whatever. Um, and I can see that, you know, just in my own self is that that's starting to go in. In fact, I thought it was interesting. The, there was an Apple watch update and it has a hand washing thing now too, that it'll, it'll see when you're start to wash your hands and it'll count down so that you do the full 20 seconds, which I was like, do we need that anymore? And I'm like, yeah, I probably need that. Anyway. Um, my question is around, um, the burnout, whether it's being locked down, whether it's being stuck in, whether it's wearing your mask and your PPE and keeping um, clean and everything else. Are you seeing a lot with that? And then in that case, do you have any other recommendations for keeping this all top of mind for both employers and customers that are listening as well? Yeah, for sure. I'm seeing burnout. It's funny that you say that, Carolyn, because I see it in myself as well. Um, but, you know, I try to remember um, that it only takes the one time for there to be an issue. And so, um, you know, I sympathize with people who are experiencing burnout. What I have noticed is that the employers who have some sort of either audit process or, you know, sort of checklist that they have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis to hold themselves accountable for taking all the steps that they're required to step uh, take, I'm sorry, do the best, right? I mean, because they, it's, it's a self-discipline and a self-policing when you have to, you know, look at a form and say, did I do this? Did I do that? You know, is my store compliant with X, Y, and Z? Um, and then it becomes almost like, you know, um, brushing your teeth every day, right? It's a chore that you have to get done and you got to make sure that you get it done. Um, and I find that those, you know, once it becomes a matter of routine, there's an audit checklist, you're, it helps also, by the way, those audit checklists can help quite a bit um, if you ever face a negligence claim. Um, so I think those are some good ways to sort of prevent burnout. Um, you know, and again, you know, I do think that that employee training, doing it not once, but, you know, often is helpful too, because it keeps things top of mind. I mean, in addition to burnout, memories fade pretty quickly. Um, and so when you keep these trainings at the forefront and maybe you put in those trainings some relevant current event stories about real things that have happened in the world so that they can kind of realize, hey, this isn't just something that I'm being asked to do on a day to day basis, but there are real consequences to not doing it. I find that can be pretty motivating as well. And we, we've talked a lot about the things that you need to do. And, and that's very critical to, as you said earlier, these, this is, these are human lives. This is, this is a health issue. Um, are there also things that people should not do? And some of those are, are less about, um, physical security and more about some other traditional issues. And, and I'm thinking an example comes to mind if somebody says, well, you know, I'm uncomfortable working. And if an employer says, why are you pregnant? Does that create something? Are there, are there no no's that, that you really can't say 
And I know there's others like you can't say somebody can't work today because they tested positive or something like that because of um, various uh, reporting. Uh, so are there also a couple quick things that you might suggest that people avoid doing even if they don't think it's a problem? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and this trips up a lot of well-meaning employers. Um, so there are what, what we call in employment law, we call them protected classes where people fit into almost everyone fits into at least one. Many of us fit into multiple protected classes, but their gender, race, disability, um, you know, religion, and there are many more, um, and what happens is sometimes employers who are very well-meaning, will they'll have watched the news and they know that there are people who are in vulnerable categories with respect to the virus. For example, we know people who are over 65 are at higher risk. And we know um, the CDC has said that there may be some consequences to people who are pregnant and contract the virus. And then, of course, people who have, you know, who are immunocompromised in some way may also be higher risk. And so there is this tendency to try to, I don't want to call it pejorative, but to try to to say, hey, we care about your safety, so you can't come to work today because you fit into one of those categories. And that you can't do. You can't tell somebody that they can't come to work just because they're 65 and older. Um, that would give rise to an age discrimination suit, um, just by way of example. What you can do, though, is if the employee comes to you and says, I am uncomfortable going to work today because I have this underlying disability that makes me more vulnerable to the virus. Well, then not only can you, but there are laws that protect those employees. You can engage in a dialogue with that employee and try to figure out whether or not you can provide what are called reasonable accommodations um, to that employee. And that may mean a leave of absence. It might mean you know, a different shift where they're not interfacing with the public. Uh, it might mean, or, or as many coworkers, it, it can mean a lot of different things. But it, that is something that you can do. You just can't make the decision for the employee. It should be something that the employee is involved in or requests. Um, so I would, without a doubt, keep those issues in mind. This is a, a complicated area of the law for sure. Um, but that's at a high level the best way to approach it. And I would imagine as a follow-up to that, you you can't say, and Jeff's not going to be coming to work because he has an underlying condition that is fill in the blank. Um, you you yeah. just have to be very vague and, and just say, you know, this is out of respect and that's all we're going to say. Yeah, exactly right, Jeff. I mean, it, it, you know, medical condition, illness, disabilities, those things are confidential and employers are not at liberty to go around telling uh, other employees or anybody else for that matter, um, you know, medical information about an employee. Um, that said, there is an obligation with respect to COVID for contact tracing, meaning if you had an employee who became ill and contracted the virus, you do have an obligation to let other employees or members of the public who you know came into close contact with that employee, you have to, an obligation to let them know that they have been potentially exposed so that they can go get tested or quarantine or take other precautions. But when you do that, you do not mention the employee's name, right? You, you certainly don't say, hey, it's, you know, Bob Smith is the person who had the virus. You would just say, we had an employee who contracted the virus. We believe you may have been in close contact and you should go get testing. Right? You can say it that simply. And, you know, a lot of people will say, especially smaller employers will say, well, if I, you know, say that, they're going to guess who it is. That may be true um, because, you know, that's just the reality that we face sometimes. But, Nonetheless, it shouldn't be you who mentions the name. You know, that brings me, I had a thought. So and we're, we are here in Virginia. We have a statewide app that um, Virginia State released, which is like basically what you just said, a con, uh, contact tracing app, but it's anonymous. So um, I downloaded it. I asked my, I made my kids download it just because I want to know if I'm in contact with someone. It tells you if you've been in close proximity with someone within, I think it's 10 or 15 feet for more than 15 minutes, like sitting behind someone at a restaurant or maybe at a you know practice or something, a sport practice. But can employers mandate that people download apps like that to phones? Yeah, so some states do have laws that prevent that for various reasons. Um, but in the majority of states, actually, yes, an employer can do that. You know, um, so some states just to be 
be careful, especially in states like California, for example. You can't punish an employee for what they do in their extracurricular time, we'll call it. Um, but in other states, you know, there are no such prohibitions. And then some states also have privacy laws, which are most of them in the states that have them are not well defined. But all that means is that there's a balancing test between the employer's interest and the employee's privacy interest. And this is a long way of saying in most states, yes, you can download that app and you could require the employee to use it. I would recommend to employers, though, that they not overly use it if it's not necessary. So, for example, we shouldn't be using it just to know exactly where your employees are at all time. Um, but if you're using it solely to tell whether or not employees may have been exposed, in most states, that's permitted. And when whether or not this is off topic or related to the contact tracing, it was interesting. We went out, uh, we ate outdoors this weekend at a place in D.C. And um, the the server came around, handed a piece of paper and a pen and said, can you put down your phone number and your name in case there's contact tracing? And then we'll get you the menu and all that other stuff. And that was like, oh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty progressive. But I also assume that... um, and and no negative feelings towards that. But I assume that also they would be at great peril if they were to eventually send me a text that says, here's a marketing pitch uh, after having positioned this as a a COVID contract contact tracing. And and that's possibly something that wasn't malicious if they were to do that, but something also you need to watch out for. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think misleading customers about the reasons you're taking their personal information is never a good idea. And that is a very good example of, of something not to do. So, Christina, these this has been really informative. And I think, like as you mentioned, we could hit refresh right now on our browser and everything, things might be different. But um, I guess one of my closing questions slash thoughts is that, is there's or a question, I guess, so there's some websites that you suggest that people listening, uh, employers especially, that they can go to on a regular basis to get up-to-date facts, um, up-to-date suggestions, uh, things like that? Sure. I, I, will, I wish there was a consolidated website that I could point you to, but I will give you the three that I think are the most important. One is the CDC. Um, the, you know, the CDC has got web pages for all kinds of different issues. But if you Google um, or use in your web browser COVID and CDC, it'll take you right to a page that does have a pretty good um, user-friendly sort of hyperlinks to different areas that might be helpful to employers. Um, the other is OSHA, and you can, again, you can just sort of type in your browser OSHA and COVID, and you'll get right to the exact page that you need. And then the third is the Department of Labor. Um, so you would you would sort of put in your web browser DOL and COVID, and it's going to bring you to the Department of Labor's information page about that. Um, that will cover laws that we just mentioned, these anti-discrimination laws, you know, what you can ask employees, like, you know, are they symptomatic? You know, can you take their temperature? Those kinds of questions that come up all the time will be right there on that Department of Labor webpage, or it'll be linked out to the EEOC, which is yet another federal agency that sort of governs these issues. But in any event, you can find quite a bit of up-to-date information there. So I would keep those three pages in mind. And then if I can add even one more, it would just be, again, make sure you know what your state and local ordinances say. Most of those are also available just by, you know, entering the right search terms in a browser. But you would want to know what your sector specific guidelines are for the state that you're in as well. Those were really helpful. So um, those of you listening can hit the back button a few times and slow it down to, to half time. And then you can listen to that. Real slow. So you make sure you write all those down when you get around a pen or paper. Well, Christina, thank you so much for your time today. Um, we've, we've I've learned a lot. It's been really helpful. Um, and so I hope we can have you again, maybe on. Of course, I'd love to. I, I appreciated being here. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much again, and thank you for listening to Convenience Matters. Convenience Matters is brought to you by Nax and produced in partnership with Human Factor. For more information, visit convenience.org.